Hello and good evening, everyone. I am Leah Rauch. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Director of Education at Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. On behalf of our Board of Directors, our volunteers, and our staff, I would like to thank you for being here for this evening's program, Muslims, the Holocaust, and Antisemitism. This program is part of our 2022 Summer Institute on teaching about historical and contemporary antisemitism. And I wanna give a special thanks to all of the educators who are participating in the Summer Institute uh, for attending tonight. We couldn't offer public programs such as this one without the incredible support of all of you who are watching right now, so thank you. Um, as well as our incredible community partners, um, specifically for tonight's program, Simple Am Shalom and the Muslim Community Center. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Manaz Afridi is Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Holocaust, Genocide and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College. She teaches courses on Islam, the Holocaust, genocide, comparative religion, and feminism. Her book, Shoah Through Muslim Eyes, was nominated for the Yad Vashem International Book Prize for Holocaust Research. She also won the 2022 award for the Lasallian Educator of the Year. She's also published numerous articles. Uh, her most recent ones include Muslim Ties to Land, Knotted Controversies and Potential Paths Toward Cooperation, An Interreligious Approach to the Holocaust, and Attitudes of Jewish and Muslim Rituals and Practices. Welcome, Dr. Afridi. Thank you so much, Leah. I'm so honored to be here at the Illinois Holocaust Museum um, program, teacher program. Hello to all the teachers and the community that's out there. I am actually presently in Sarajevo, um, Bosnia. So it is right now one o'clock my time. But as, as I told Leah that I took a little nap and so I feel fresh for work. So I just, um, I'm very, very happy and pleased to be here and to sort of like walk through and ask some questions about um, anti-Semitism in <clears throat> the Muslim world and also in the Arab world, but also why it's important to understand the Holocaust and what it means and why I chose to do, to do this kind of work. So I have uh, a few slides to go through and kind of carve out some stories that I think are important and some stories are challenging, but also stories of reconciliation, because the goal of all my work um, as a Muslim and as a Holocaust educator and someone who teaches Islam is to create alliances and to create peace and understanding through actually very challenging topics. So that's sort of my life in a nutshell. And so I'm here actually in Sarajevo because it is the 27th anniversary of the Srebrenica um, genocide um, massacre. And so I was here to teach a workshop and also to support um, the memorial and their own program where they teach a lot of um, students from all over, but also Bosnians, Croats, and Serbians. So I was really proud to be here and I come here quite often. And Sarajevo is beautiful. If you have not visited, you must come to Bosnia. All right, so let me start. Um, if you can just go to the next slide. Um, my topic, Muslims, the Holocaust and antisemitism, is uh, really informed by many very important things that have shaped my own thinking. And I just wanted to share different perspectives on the connections between what I do, which is uh, teach, teach students about colonialism and also the history of the Holocaust. And in 20, 2006, a British historian, Dan Stone, argued that overseas imperialism acted as a model for Nazi claims for Lebensraum, living space. To him, the to him, the Holocaust should be understood as a continuation of the policies undertaken by the European imperial powers. So here you have someone who's a historian, Dan Stone is quite well known, and he's talking about how living space, this idea of the colonial mind, shaped also what happened during the Holocaust. Um, for example, in my classes, I start with the Herrera genocide in uh, West Africa, where basically Germans went because they wanted more living space. And that's literally what Lebensraum means. Elie Wiesel, on the other hand, uh, proclaimed that the Holocaust was not one atrocity in history, but a revelation. 
Auschwitz was a unique phenomena, he reflected, a unique event like the revelation at Sinai. So for Elie Wiesel and some Holocaust survivors, not all, um, the Holocaust was about um, being Jewish, but also revelation about human evil, right? And what we were, what our capacity was and how Sinai, where the revelation that Moses brought with him uh, was like a revelation in terms of the Holocaust for the Jewish people where 6 million Jews were killed. So for me, the Holocaust is entangled with colonial history that sometimes implicates other religious minorities, indigenous people, and the, and the case of Muslims and Arabs. And I got very interested in not just looking at the Holocaust, but I studied Judaism, I studied the Torah, and I looked at even um, Jewish culture and history in different places. Uh, in 2018, I took a group of 52 women to both Poland and um, Berlin, Germany, um, there were 52 Muslim and Jewish women. So it was a really very interesting trip, but also very much about peace and how we can understand each other's history. Next slide, please. And then um, Muslims and Jews, what connections do we have? We have many connections, right? We have religious connections to Abraham, God, and Moses. We have historical sacred spaces, some that we recognize, some that we fight about. Living in empires under Christians is a common thing that we had to do and have done. Living in empires under Muslims, right? So Muslims, other Muslim minorities also lived under Muslim empires. And colonialism and the Holocaust have this really important connection that I try to make in a class that I teach called Muslims and the Holocaust at Manhattan College. And a lot of my Muslim students take the class with me to understand, well, how is this connected? How are Muslims connected to the Holocaust? And they're intrigued. And so we study the Holocaust, but we also study colonialism, especially in North Africa. Um, and look at why colonialism has any connection to it and how can we understand this in a larger way? So my goal is always to expand the field of the Holocaust, expand it geographically, expand it in terms of different religions, understanding it, but also, expand it in terms of history, right? And look at where was the positionality of Muslims and Arabs at that, at that time. And World War II is expansive. Um, and it's very expansive in terms of understanding how everybody was sort of implicated in the war, I'm not talking about the Holocaust, but just the war itself and the mapping of the world and how it changed so much. I mean, here I'm sitting in Bosnia, which has also changed a lot um, in terms of former Yugoslavia, and it keeps changing, especially after 1995, after the Bosnian genocide, but also its history with World War II and fascism and Nazism that occurred here um, also in what was at that time Yugoslavia. Next, uh, next slide, please. So why the Holocaust and Muslims? Um, <clears throat> this is a picture taken of both Jews and Muslims during the Holocaust. Um, this is set in Tunisia, uh, and um, Tunisia was a place that was colonized um, by the Vichy government. The Vichy government was working with the Nazi party after Germany invaded France, and um, the, the Vichy were very much collaborators, but also perpetrators in their own way towards their colonies. And so at that time, it's important for me to explain to teachers and students and people the colonial history, right? So why were, why were the French in Tunisia or Morocco or Algeria or um, even Libya, where the Nazis actually were there themselves for six months? So not, the Nazi party controlled a lot of these areas that France already was in control of and had colonies of. And they also persecuted Jews in these areas and threatened the Arabs and Muslims that lived there. Um, and because there were already colonial powers, Arabs and Muslims in those places were also very much um, frightened and sometimes only for survival reasons um, complied with whatever the Vichy government wanted. Next slide, please. So Muslims in the Holocaust, did Muslims play a role in the Holocaust? Yes, they did. They did play a role. They did not compel the Holocaust. And I have corrected that. Um, I know that uh, former um, Prime Minister uh, ben Benjamin Netanyahu had said that Muslims compel the Holocaust and al Hosseini did, and I corrected that. So you can also Google that. Um, the Holocaust was really created by 
uh, the Nazis and the perpetrators and people who are the onlookers is it all, all in what is Europe, um, especially in Western and Eastern Europe. Why would you connect the Holocaust to Muslims? Why would I connect the Holocaust to Muslims? What do we have to do with it? Well, I think it gives us a very different picture of what happened during World War II, but also the understanding that Muslims and Jews lived together in Arab countries um, for, for many years, hundreds of years, and shared a lot of cultural and religious um, practices, but also beliefs and also culture and language. Why is this work relevant and important today? It's important today because it's a challenging time. It's a challenging time always for Jews and Muslims, but also a challenging time for us to bridge uh, together the peace, uh, pe peace in a way that is now really frowned upon or seen as you know something that we cannot achieve. I still believe optimistically that we can achieve this. And how do Jews and Muslims respond to this today? I think. There are very few people who really know about the North African story of the Holocaust. There are very few people who know about anti-Semitism and how it got into the Arab and Muslim world. There are very few people who actually think of Muslims in the context of the Holocaust, but it also makes um, the Jewish audience think about colonialism and the impact it had on the Muslim world, which is very, very deep rooted. And there are many, many re reverberations of that that we are still dealing with today. And then in terms of of, of the Muslim audiences, they start to understand more about Jews and how Jews were handpicked and how actually there was the final solution of Jews um, being annihilated in the world. And this shows the expansion of the Nazi and the Vichy party and the fascists, including Mussolini, who really did want to get rid of Jews off the first face of the earth. And this is why I call in my book, show through Muslim eyes that the Holocaust is not unique, but it's unprecedented, unprecedented in the fact of genocides. If you study genocides, um, you will never see that, you know, for example, in Bosnia, when the genocide happened, they didn't go to Albania and murder Muslims. But here it was a real plan to murder Jews in places like Greece and in places like North Africa, wherever they could find them. Next slide, please. What do we know about the expansion of the Holocaust? We know that it was in North Africa. Uh, Libya was under Italian fascism. Tunisia, French Vichy government. Morocco, French Vichy. And Algeria, but this is before Algeria was independent, also French Vichy. And they're very interesting stories. There are testimonies uh, of Jews uh, who were living in these places that you can find at the USC Show Foundation or you can find the US Holocaust Museum and Yad Vashem that all sort of show what was going on around them and how they felt part of the fabric of being Arab Jews and how they were persecuted by um, the Vichy government and the Nazis. They also were betrayed by Muslims and Arabs um, and that comes out in these testimonies and in a lot of the history that you read today about North Africa. Um, my friend Omar Baum and Sarah Stein have written a book called North Africa and the Holocaust, which is a compilation of articles of how laws changed uh, in terms of the racial laws between Jews and Arabs in under the Vichy government. Um, so there is an upcoming like uh, opening of the field of looking at Muslims in the Holocaust and Arab world in the Holocaust, which is very interesting. I also want to mention that in Dubai, there is also a museum um, on the Holocaust and about rescue stories of Muslims and Arabs, which is very nice to see because it is actually a, uh, a museum that talks about peace and the commonality of Muslims and Jews. Next slide, please. So anti-Semitism uh, means prejudice against or hatred of Jews. I'm sure most of you know that the Holocaust is state-sponsored persecution and the murder of European Jews by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945 is history's most extreme example of anti-Semitism. There are many, many controversies today about how and why we should define anti-Semitism. And it's basically because of Israel and Palestine, right? So I'm not going to avoid that topic. I know it's in everyone's mind. Um, and it's been sort of like we define in ways because whether you critique Israel or whether you don't critique Israel, it's become a very big sort of controversy. Those of us that live in the United States um, realize that there is a lot of this kind of challenges when we talk about anti-Semitism and also, of course, Islamophobia, but more so anti-Semitism. So I am somebody who believes in the state of Israel 
and I'm also pro-Palestinian, and I also criticize the state of Israel, um, and that I believe is not anti-Semitic. Um, but I fight very hard against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia both, which is very hard to do in a political sort of challenging climate in the United States. Now, a lot of Muslims don't know why it is called anti-Semitism, and I know some Arabs will argue with me and my friends will that anti-Semitism could be also anti-Arab because of the language. It is a linguistic term um, that was, but it was coined in 1879. And this is why I have this quote by the journalist Willem Marr. Um, he denoted the hatred of Jews and also hatred of various liberal cosmopolitan and international political trends of the 18th and 19th centuries often associated with the Jews. The trends under attack, including equal civil rights, constitutional democracy, free trade, socialism, finance, capitalism, and pacifism. So this term, to me, at least as a scholar, it really doesn't um, connotate um, you know, the hatred of Jews, period. Um, there is, of course, the hatred of Arabs, I talk, I talk a lot about Orientalism and Islamophobia, but that's also a very different way of looking at the Arab and the Muslim. Next slide, please. How did anti-Jewish sentiment transfer to the Arab and Muslim context? So when I wrote the book, uh, show through Muslim, Muslim eyes, and at the end, I'll show you a video of me interviewing Holocaust survivors in my teaching. Um, one of the things that I noticed was there was a lot of anti-Semitism in my own community. I'm originally from Pakistan, born there, but was raised in Europe um, and the Middle East, and then came to the United States in high school. And I always was very confused because in Europe, I had Jewish friends, Christian friends um, in schools, and we would share, like they would come over for Eid at my house, which is the, like end of Ramadan or even just the Eid we just had. And then I would go to their house for Hanukkah, um, I had a Russian Orthodox friend. My parents were very open, very accepting. Like I believe that most Muslims are about other faiths. Um, and then when I moved to the Middle East, um, there was a real kind of sort of disappearance of Jews. There were no more Jews there. And I was not sure what was going on as a child. And then when I moved to New York, it was uh, at Scarsdale, which is a predominantly Jewish American high school. And there was, um, some calls made to my house about you effing Arabs leave this neighborhood. So I became very confused as a child and I was like, wait, what's going on? You know, I have Jewish friends, but there's so much tension between Jews and Muslims. And of course I realized it was it, a lot of it was political, but also I wanted to write something as a Muslim, just to acknowledge the fact that there were indeed 6 million Jews that were killed, that we should not relativize, that we should not uh, question those things that it's important to acknowledge each other and do it openly and I wanted to put it on paper I mean my book is really about my journey it's about Islamic social justice it's about Islamic principles in Islam we are told not to um, stand uh, with people with false rumors to be truthful and even to fight against our own community if it is for the truth and the justice of another people so I started my journey that way, and it was through Islam and the, the social principles that I learned that led me to this journey. And I, and I think that's really important for me to say to everyone in the audience so they can understand. So Jews started to migrate, as most people know, from Europe to Palestine in high numbers in the 1870s and then in the 1930s. There's also uh, a whole section in my classes where I talk about what is Zionism and how did Zionism start? What are the different um, strains of Zionism? How do we understand it? And why is it today seen as a dirty word? And that's another whole conversation we can have at some point. Um, Jews were seen as European uh, because they were coming from Europe, right? I mean, they were literally coming from Europe and they were European. They themselves, Jews, believed they were European. They assimilated. Some of them lost their faith uh, to become more European and accepted. And country like Germany, right? I mean, they they spoke German, they dressed German, um, and but they were still seen as Jews. And so to see them as European when they started to migrate into Palestine was only, only normal because they brought with them European tools of thinking, European ways, European languages, but the only difference was that they were Jews, they had a different faith altogether. 
And a lot of Jews that did migrate were not all religious. Um, a lot of them were secular or migrated for political reasons or for safety. Jews were seen as aligned with the colonial powers, Britain and then the US. And this is from the perspective of Muslims and Arab surrounding countries because they were indeed coming from the perspective that they had been colonized by Britain especially, and then the United States was the first country to recognize Israel. So this becomes very complicated because what I'm asking you to do is look at different perspectives at the same time, which is a very, very hard thing to do. But this is really important that we do this and we do this with uh, not, not, not sort of being felt like we're being attacked, but this is a historical reality, historical perceptions that went on between Jews and Arabs for a long time. Next slide, please. Um, there was a Bosnian, uh, Bosnian soldiers who fought with the National Socialist. And this is a picture that unfortunately you see a lot. If you Google Muslims in the Holocaust, you see Al Hosseini. And I kind of want to dispel that. I think. If you Google Muslims in the Holocaust, you see me, which is better because you don't want to see that, oh, well, there was this Bosnian Muslim army that was fighting for the fat. And there was, there was an army. Um, it was a very small Hazar army and it did not last very long for about three to four months. And this, the question that you must be asking is like, why is she telling us this? Why were they even formed? And you know, who formed them? Next slide. So um, the book that, if you're interested in this topic, written by David Matadil, he's a British historian. He wrote Islam and Nazi Germany's War. And uh, what he explains in that book, and if you go to the Berlin archives, you will also discover a lot of this, is that at the height of the war in 1941-42, when the German troops entered Muslim populated territories in the Balkans, North Africa, Crimea, and Caucasus, and we're approaching the Middle East and Central Asia, Berlin began to see Islam as politically significant. Nazi Germany made significant attempts to promote an alliance with the Muslim world against their alleged common enemies, the British Empire, of course, the Soviet Union, America, and then the Jews. Um, you know, Germany was, had basically no allies and they were looking for allies in countries that would align with them. And they knew that there was a migration into Palestine um, they also knew that there was a resentment to this migration because of the colonial history of Muslims uh, with, with Britain especially, and also in terms of looking at who was occupying their territories. And so they used that moment uh, very well. And in the war zones, Germany engaged with a wide range of religious policies and propaganda to promote the Nazi regime as patron of Islam. Um, if you read this book and you even read um, manuscripts on what Hitler really loved about Islam, he would, you know, uh, say, oh, you know, if everyone was Muslim, we wouldn't have these problems. I mean, there was many, many things that he said uh, about the positivity, the social egalitarianism, which sounds very nice to Muslims because that's what we're built on is egalitarianism. But he used that a lot. And so did his propagandists. As early as 1941, uh, the Weimar uh, dis distributed the military handbook Islam to train its soldiers to behave correctly towards Muslim populations. I mean, in Berlin, you can go and see um, how they preserved mosques uh, because of Muslims, because they wanted the Muslims to align with them. And on the German side, pragmatic strategic interests were the most important driving force behind this policy. In its propaganda, however, especially in the Arab world, anti-Semitic themes played an important role. Anti-Semitic propaganda was often connected to attacks against the Zionist migration to Palestine, which had emerged as a main topic in Arab and political discourses. The Third Reich's engagement with Islam was not only that Muslim populated regions had become part of the war zones, but also more importantly that from 1941 to 42, Germany's military situation had deteriorated. In the Soviet Union, Hitler's blitzkrieg strategy had failed. And as the wine mark came under pressure, strategics in, Berlin, strategists in Berlin began to seek broader war coalitions, thereby demonstrating remarkable pragmatism, right? So this is an important moment. Um, it's an important moment because it's not to blame Nazis that, you know, that's why there is anti-Semitism in the Arab and Muslim world, but it is a moment to think about in terms of the engagement with the Muslim world at this point. So you have like the Ottomans that fell in 1922, you had 
the deterioration of the Muslim um, empire economically with no allies. Um, you had a lot of um, a lot of countries that were in Africa, Asia, and in the Arab world trying to be independent from the colonizers. So it was a very important moment for Muslims as well as for Jews and in totally different ways. Um, and this is why I'm saying it's hard to look at this perspective and to gain a distance and to say, okay, and I'm saying this as a Muslim, right? I mean, this is part of history and to understand one's own history, even if it's a painful and challenging history. Next slide. What do you know about colonialism? And I think that's something, if I were to tell teachers anything would be, please teach something about what is colonialism in America, because I find so many of my students that come into my classes and I you know, teach, of course, college. And also I teach on the graduate level um, at Gratz College. Um, I find that most students and adults don't know anything about colonialism and the impact it had on the world, not just the Muslim world, but also, you know, Africa, where there are Christians um, that live there, and also in our own country, in North America, and what that means. So I would really encourage people to start to think about that as a real problem and as, as a real um, force that took away language and culture and religion from people. And the whole role of Christians and the missionaries that went around all of Africa and Asia. So I'll give you an example. My mother went to Catholic school because she really didn't have a choice to go to a Muslim school. So she would go to Catholic school, be respectful to the nuns, do her Hail Mary and come home and do her Salat, which is the Muslim prayer. So for her, it was kind of this natural sort of binary situation. Um, that she was raised in. I mean, for my generation, it was different because, you know, Pakistan had become independent and had, you know, more of its own institutions. Um, and I wasn't raised, I was raised in Europe anyway, but, you know, a lot of my cousins just sort of went to school and they were Muslims. Um, a really interesting um, thing to think about also is how colonialism impacted Jews, right? So there were Jews that were living in Algeria and when Algeria was taken over by the Vichy, there were no more Jewish schools. Um, and then Jews weren't um, allowed to speak Hebrew anymore. They had to speak French under the colonists. So, you know, Arabs and Jews were both impacted together in these places in the similar ways. And if you look, especially at the case of Morocco, um, and you look at the detailed racial laws, it kept flipping Jews and Muslims against and for each other, which is also another very interesting complex story in terms of the history of Jewish-Muslim relations. So colonialism is a policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. And this is why most, um, most colonists went to Asia and Africa is to exploit economically. Next slide, please. The Holocaust and colonialism is not a comparison. I want to make sure that everyone understands that, but it's a moment in time in history with two different, very important forces that were deep rooted in both the Jewish and Muslim culture. And I'm just using that very widely in terms of Jew and Muslim. I know there's Arabs, there's Ashkenazi, there's Sephardic and same with the Arab world, Asian and African and Eastern European where I'm sitting. Um, the questions that I want us to ask together is, can we understand the historical context at different times of one another? How does this provide an understanding of power structures? Does this define the many challenges that we face today between Jews and Muslims? And how do we acknowledge Muslims and the colonial memories and boundaries um, that they too face in these places? Next slide, please. So here's just a map colonies in North Africa and Middle East. I love this map because it tells you who the British, who the British are controlling, what the Vichy Garp French control was, the, the French Free Forces, the Third Reich, the Italian control, the Soviet Union, and the neutral countries. It gives you a really nice map of what was going on during World War II. Um, and this was going on before, right? Colonization started way before World War II, but it sustained itself. And countries um, became independent just in the 40s and 50s. I mean, Muslim countries. And then of course, Israel, uh, was declared a state in 1948. So all of this kind of happened around each other at the same time. And I think it's worth looking at in terms of understanding our history of the African, the Arab, the Asian, the, 
and also looking at Palestine um, before and then after Israel was uh, became a state. Next slide, please. The Nazis established 17 slave labor camps, um, three in Morocco, three in Algeria, seven in Tunisia, and four in Libya. Robert Satlov has a great book, uh, Amongst the Righteous, who was looking for Arab, uh, Arabs who saved um, uh, Jews uh, from persecution. And there were many, and there were not just Arabs, but there were Muslims, there were Turks, and you'll see some of those images now. But I want us, want us to understand that these slave labor camps were in these areas, and a lot of them. Um, there are a few that you can still see. Some of them have been destroyed. And the perpetrators were, of course, mainly the captains of these camps who were French, but also they used Arabs and Muslims to carry out their work, uh, which is something that we have to acknowledge looking at um, <clears throat> what these slave labor, labor camps looked at. Next slide, please. Concentration camp in Libya. Um, they were very different from say Eastern Europe and other places uh, in Western Europe, but they were in the middle of the Sahara and some of them were basically left um, in just the heat to die. Some were buried alive. Um, and this was a very um, sort of, you know, there weren't, the camps were not located in the cities. If you've ever seen Casablanca with Humphrey um, Bogart, uh, there's a reference to the camps in Morocco, even in that movie about being sent to the camps. So, I mean, there is there are some references, but it was a real buried story for a long, long time. And I think a lot of Muslims also don't know about it because they didn't know where the camps were, but the ones that were out there did know and acknowledged that there were camps and slave labor camps in these places. Next, please. Jewish-Muslim relations, colonialism and Holocaust, is it just break down? Uh, European aggression, the European plan of annihilation to take over resources, the final solution, Muslim, African, Arab, and Asian people were oppressed for 200 years, primarily Jews and other minorities were to be murdered. We're just looking at how can we see these at different times and moments, what can we find from these little pieces of information and history, and how does that impact us today? Next, please. I'm going to be almost done. Let us share some positive and uncommon stories, right? So next slide, I want to read the subtitle, yeah. So three years of camp, a year of concentration camp, two years of the disciplinary center, 1940 to 43. Um, Adeski Barkani left a diary that he wrote in 1964 about being in a camp in Algeria. And he was a resistance fighter and he was imprisoned along with the Jews. And the French did that with Arabs and especially resistance fighters. And this diary, and I just want to mention this briefly, talks about how the captain tried to pit the Jews and Muslims against each other, but he said it was a phenomenal experience because what happened, Jews and Muslims actually aligned in the camps against the French. So it just shows a complicated history where there were Arabs and, and I mean, Muslims and Jews together in one camp and um, how they were being pitted against each other. And the captain was convinced the Arabs would kill the Jews, but they didn't, they stood by them. So it's a beautiful story if you wanna read it. I'm, I'm in the process of, it's in French. So we translated, I'm in the process of trying to get it published. So it would be open public for everyone. Next slide. So what was the role of Muslims under the Vichy? Um, here, I just love these images because on the right side, you have this woman, in a job, you know, reading Le Monde, um, of course, colonized French speaker on the left actually is a Jewish family. And so sometimes these images, you can't tell the difference between Jew and Arab. I mean, they look very similar. I've done exercises with students where I show them images of Jews and Arabs, and they can't really tell, like, is this a Jew? Is this Muslim? Because they really do share their culture and their experiences. Next slide. Um, there were many rescuers, and I'm going to go through this quite quickly because I don't want to <clears throat> run out of time, but um, Khaled Abdul Wahab, there's a really wonderful group called I Am the Protector, run by a, a Jewish woman, and she it talks about, you know, Muslims that actually protect Jews and, and Christians, and he was uh, from Tun in Tunisia, and he actually um, rescued a whole family in his farm in the back when he was entertaining SS soldiers. So you can find 
a lot of great information about Khalid Abdul Wahab. Um, next slide, please. The Moroccan king uh, was somebody who said that I would never give up my Jews because all my citizens are Moroccan first. It doesn't matter if they're Jewish, it doesn't matter if they're Christian, it doesn't matter who they are. Um, sadly, as you know, there's also you know, the history of 70,000 Jewish Arabs leaving um, Arab countries um, during the 1950s and 60s because of the wars um, in terms of Israel and other countries. So as a Muslim, I recognize that. And I think that's very painful. It's really sad to see that. Now you have very few Jews in many of these countries. Um, and that's something else that we have to think about in terms of well, who, who actually lives in Israel, right? I mean, there's a lot of Arab Jews that live in Israel and why do they live there? And why did they move there? And what, what is it about? And what happened in the 1950s in terms of this kind of movement um, to a different um, place altogether where they would feel safe? Next slide, please. Albania was the only country in Europe to rescue all of its Jewish citizens and more, which is amazing. Um, they have a term called Besa, which means the promise, but they also use the Quran, and you can read stories all about them and how they um, kept the, the, the Torah, they kept um, the Hanukkah candles for their Jewish neighbors. Um, they were incredible. And there were Jews that went into Albania during World War II which, who were rescued too. So there were more Jews in Albania than there were. Uh, before World War II. So it's an incredible story, a very important story, a story to be told because the Albanians actually went through communism right after that. And some of their rescuers were actually killed under communism. So it's also sad, but it just shows you, shows you the strength of a country and shows you that Islamic principles were about protection of the other. Next, please. <clears throat> and Ad Khan, she's kind of my favorite. Her heroine, she was an Indian Muslim uh, woman rescuer and was killed at Dacha. She was actually a spy for the British and she was found out because of the color blue. I'm writing a fictional story about her right now. And um, she risked her life uh, so that she could spy on the Nazis and give information to the British. And so she's known as a rescuer as well. Next, please. Um, the Turkish Vice Council, Ismail Najek Kent, was another person who changed passports. And he had paper identity, changed the identity papers of Jews and changed their names so they would not be deported to Nazi gas chambers. Next, please. Director of the Grand Mosque of Paris, Si Khadur bin Gabit, who kept Jews. Um, and we don't have much historical evidence, but we have one or two testimonies of Jews that were rescued un under him that have come out and spoken, um, second and third generation. Next. Uh, Iranian Schindler, Abul Hussein Sardari, very smart guy. He changed the name, uh, not only the names of Jews, but he tried to prove to the Nazis that uh, in France, that there, the Jews were not really Semitic, but they were mosaic people. And you have to read about it because it's really brilliant and about how um, it, how Muslims were the same as Jews, and he proved it to several Nazi officers. And he, I think he rescued about 40 families. So that's a pretty incredible force. And I love this story because Iran is just seen in such a negative light. So it's actually displayed at my center um, as one of the Iranian Schindlers that we can look at and see Iranian people as human and as people who actually cared about Jews and other people during the war. Next, please. Here's the interesting, I mean, this is from the, <clears throat> from the Auschwitz Museum. Here is a list of Muslims killed in camps. So a majority of them are from um, Croatia and Russia and Albania. And the question I always ask is like, what were they doing? Well, they were actually going to Europe and different places for work and economy, and they got caught up in the war. And of course, they also too were seen as minorities. So you can see that there were um, in Auschwitz one, two, and three, there's 46 that we know um, that were killed, um, maybe 67. Some we know were killed, murdered. Some we know that disappeared. There are some tracing services at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, but there's 70,000. Um, pages of that. I've only looked at like a hundred. But um, so here's another story, you know, that Muslims were actually uh, murdered in different camps 
um, during the Holocaust. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and just have you play my video. Um, it's a five minute video. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time, 15 minutes for questions. You know many Muslims? Have you talked to Muslims? No, I wish I would. Because for me, it doesn't matter. You are Muslim, you are a human being. I love people. Mm -hmm. When I speak, I never ever think about that is Muslim or Catholic or Protestant or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just see a human being. And that's the way I was raised, actually. Mm -hmm. What is your main message to Muslims? about the Holocaust? I don't know if anyone completely understand what happened there. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, what happened, that's true. Mm -hmm. Why that did happen, and the whole world was looking at and didn't do anything, that's one thing I don't understand. Mm -hmm. But one thing I understand, that we should all like each other, talk to each other, and try to understand each other. Talking to you, I forget that, you know, you are, you are Muslim today? Yes. Okay, I, I totally forget that, but... Uh, but that's good. We shouldn't look yeah, at our... I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> that's but precisely the, the point of this I know, I realize that yeah. the question I have for the Muslims, do you really believe that any paper we sign is going to have an effect on the children that you teach to kill? Mm -hmm. That's the question I want to ask. Okay, perfect question. The gas chambers especially are seen by a lot of people as a fabrication. As difficult as it is for me to ask you this, could you perhaps shed light on that from your perspective? Well, you know, only a totally ignorant human being would say today that it didn't happen. I don't have the right to forgive. It's, it's not my job to forgive. God is the only one that can forgive. I only have to remember and be aware all the time of what can happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I try, try to do my job. Like you are doing yours. <laughs> Have you been threatened? Have I been threatened? Yes. I'm sure. As a Muslim, yes. Both in my community and outside of my community. I'm sure. So, I mean, I also spend a lot of time, Renee, going to Jewish temples mm -hmm. and um, showing similarities of justice between Judaism and Islam. I don't care what color, what creed, what, what you do in life, as long as you're a decent person. That's, that's enough for me. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you a religious Muslim? I believe, yes. You believe? You believe there's, there's some, there, do you believe there's somebody upstairs who's going to guide your life, who's going to make you a better person? I don't think that person is going to make me a better person, but I think there's something there that that's, is not that's, guiding me. That, that, then then you, you, you go through your life with rules, the rules that the Muslims are giving you. Is that, is that what it is? I'm asking you. I'm not, I'm not judging you. I'm asking you a question. No, I don't go with the rules that... Because a lot given. of people do that, right. including the Jewish religion. If a Muslim is watching, what do you want to say to them? I say, get an education. Learn about life. Don't be in your little sphere only. And just don't see anybody else but yourself. And that's, and if you do that, if you get educated, maybe we'll have a better chance in this world. So there's stories that were told during Muhammad's life in the sixth century. Jihad means struggle. Okay, okay. So, so jihad has several connotations. One is holy war. Not direct translation, but the result is holy war. Which means if someone comes to your house and forces you and your family out or kills you, you have the right to defend yourself with struggling against them through jihad. However, it doesn't mean that you kill them. The Holocaust is unique, right? Holocaust was not just in Germany, it was in Poland, it was in Czech, it was in Italy, 
It was all over. It was in Tunisia. So the whole point of the Holocaust was to exterminate Jews off the face of the earth. I don't care if someone wants to sit there and deny it, they can do it. They're blue in the face. All right. Thank you so much, Manaz. Uh, we are now going to open it up for the questions from the audience here tonight. So we have a few submitted. If you have any questions that you think of, um, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A. Uh, the first question that we have is, do you see parallels between anti-Muslim movements in a post 9-11 world and anti-Semitism in the US? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big question. I mean, there are parallels. Um, as a matter of fact, today I was speaking to my Bosnian friend who actually teaches here. I mean, he's also a researcher in the Islamic library, the only library that actually survived um, the war. And, you know, he and I are talking about Western Europe and we're talking about the United States. And one of the things that, you know, Muslim Americans do much better in the United States. And I'll tell you why. It's because, well, it is a place of opportunity, but we are way more diverse. Um, and where we are such a small percentage of the United States, um, so are Jews. But th the parallels are different because if you look at the anti-Semitism that is coming from the alt-right, the white nationalist movements, their platform is against Jews. Um, their whole, um, if you look at the rally in um, Charlottesville, um, th the one thing that they were chanting was Jews, don't belong here. Um, and it's it's this idea that somehow Jews, again, this mythology, this anti-Semitism, which is a trope everywhere actually in the world, but also in these extremist groups that Jews will somehow control, they'll pollute, they will take away, they will they control, con I mean, I get this in my classes, control Congress, they control the money. Uh, it's an, unbelievable. Um, I think with Muslims, um, the fear is of extremism. Um, it, it's a different kind of fear. And it's a fear that comes from not understanding who Muslims and Arabs are. I mean, you would think after 9-11, Americans would say, wow, we need to understand this religion more. No, we haven't. Um, I feel the same way teaching my Islam. I mean, I teach a class called Muslims in America and I start from African-American Muslims who came here in terms of slavery all the way up to cont contemporary. And you know, the, the you know, these are just average, you know, American students um, with different backgrounds. And they come in with that perspective that, yes, Muslims are extremists, that we are oppressing our women. It's the same kind of stereotypes, right? So there is that parallel, the Jewish stereotype and the Muslim stereotype. And how do you, how do you talk about it? And I think one of the things that we have in the United States, which is amazing, is we have religious freedom. That is such a gift that we do not talk about enough. We don't have religious freedom in Germany. We don't have religious freedom in France. I can't wear a hijab if I wanted to in a public school. I couldn't work in the public sector with a cross on or a yarmulke. Um, so these are things that we don't realize. Also, I have to say that in, in the Muslim world, there isn't that much religious freedom. I'm saying this as a Pakistani that we have squashed out our Christian community. We have squashed out any Jews that were left, it's, at least in my birthplace in Karachi in 2002. It's like, it's gone. We have crypto Jews um, that cannot show their, their difference. So I think that this is something that we all need to think about. And, you know, um, also Israel has its own issues about diversity, right? And looking at diverse religions. So I think one thing that we have to really think about as, as Muslim and Jewish Americans or, or Christian Americans or secular Americans is that we indeed do still have, have this freedom. And when the Muslim ban was brought about by our last administration, I remember going with my daughter who was very young at that time. Uh, she's a little bit older now. Um, and there were more Jews uh, standing up for the rights of Muslims than Muslims themselves. I mean, it was an amazing feeling. And I remember Jews said, Menaz, we will wear the yellow star for you if, if that word ever comes up, the Muslim ban. And so there is solidarity in America and we need to celebrate that 
and, and stop getting swayed in ways um, that I think are not very productive. Um, someone is asking if you could comment on the film and please forgive my French, French pronunciation here. Uh, Léon Libre, uh, Dr. Mohamed Helmi, and Satlaf's book, Among the Righteous. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Mohamed Helmi was a Egyptian uh, who rescued a family. Um, and Robert Satloff wrote a book called Amongst the Righteous, and it's about looking for, I mean, he actually went to Tunisia and did some of the work on the labor camps, and he tried to bring people together. And actually, Robert started this journey because of 9-11. He felt like, he wanted to change the perception of non-Muslims uh, about Islam. And one of the ways that he was trying to do this is to find an Arab um, who would be recognized at Yad Vashem. Now, Yad Vashem recognized Mohammed Al-Halmi, the Egyptian doctor, but the family refused to take the title of amongst the righteous because it came from Yad Vashem, Israel. And so that's the the kind of controversy. So even the rescue stories, um, when there was an Arab that was finally recognized, the family itself was like, no, we don't want it because it's coming from Israel and we don't want to have anything to do with Israel. That's all I can make. But I think that's what they're referring to. Um, so someone just asked a follow-up question about the film. It's called Leon Libre. Is that how you pronounce it? Leon Libre, yeah, the free man, yeah. I will, I can put that in the chat so everyone can uh, see that as well. There we go. Um, okay, there is uh, another question asking, um, why is it important to highlight the differences between Jews and Muslims um, rather than, than focusing more on the similarities? I mean, I think I, I do both. Um, I think when I'm, I think that's more challenging is to see the differences. And I think it's, it's harder for us. Um, I think, you know, if you look at xenophobia or any kind of phobia or, or racism that we have or prejudice, which we all have, by the way, including myself, um, is that we don't like something when we don't understand it. And, I, and I'm trying to get to a place, especially in my teaching and my scholarship, where we can sort of be comfortable with the differences, um, even if it's not what you believe. Um, it doesn't mean you don't stand up for what you believe or you don't stand up for your truth, but understand the perspective. You know, it's so hard to listen to each other uh, when you already have your mind made up about something. Um, so if you really do some deep listening to each other, I think it makes, it makes a big difference. Similarities, of course, I talk a lot about similarities, um, especially, you know, in terms of religious similarities, um, the history, Arab history that Jews and Muslims share, um, sacred texts I've written about that, um, how, you know, there's so many things about social justice. Um, I just wrote an article on, on Jewish and Muslim rituals and also how we deal with the calendar is very interesting. So yes, definitely, you know, as someone who studies religion, I definitely point that out, but in this sort of, in this arena of the Holocaust and colonialism, these are very different experiences. They collide in, in, in a way that's very different that I'm, I'm pretty much asking people to think a little differently about these two aspects. Were Muslims treated differently in the camps than other prisoners? Not really, no. They were treated as badly <laughs> as other prisoners. I mean, the thing is, um, you, I, I mean, you mean the camps uh, in Europe or the camps in North Africa? Because there were, I mean, once you're in a camp, you're in a camp. There was no sort of like special treatment for you. Um, the only special treatment, I mean, this is just a general comment that people got in, in camps is through doing work for the Nazis, people they wanted to keep alive. And special treatment means a little more food or, you know, less uh, beatings or less, you know, kind of 
discomfort. Um, it's in no way like a better treatment, but that's people are kept alive that way in a lot of ways. Um, someone is asking about Bosnian Muslims um, because they are white passing, um, uh -huh. saying that uh, their friends and allies in the Bosnian communities in the US recognize that not being Muslim of Arab heritage has sadly made it easier in some sense for them um, and asking if, if you could comment on that. Um, sure, I mean, you know, Bosnia is a specific example. I mean, you could use other like white passing, if you want to call it Arabs or Muslims. Um, you know, if you look at the demographics, most Arabs sign, if they sign like a survey, they they sign white. Now they have Arab and Middle Eastern. It's a different thing. Like Latin America also signs white, you know, so it's, it depends on how you see yourself. But I think Bosnia is specific because Bosnians were persecuted because they were Muslim, right? So they're, that's always on the forefront of their mind in terms of what happened here and the genocide. And, and it's everywhere. It's, it's still very much a raw memory 27 years later. Um, but also in, in terms of racialization, I mean, that is a problem we really do have in America, but it's, it's also in Europe, right? It's everywhere. Um, and I think within, for me as a Muslim, I'm very conscious of that because, you know, I'm an Asian Muslim and there are Arab Muslims and there are African Muslims. And it's interesting how we, we have this sort of hierarchy. And I know it's in Judaism too, in terms of color and racialization, but I don't think Bosnian Muslims, um, are just passing. I think they do feel very much connected to their religion. Um, I think um, passing means that you're not discriminated against as openly as say a black person of any faith would be. Um, that's sort of how I would think about it. All right, well, thank you so much for this excellent program. I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone attending tonight learned a lot as well. Um, I am putting a, a link in the chat to our upcoming public programs uh, at Illinois Holocaust Museum. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, you can all join us for some really exciting and dy dynamic programs coming up uh, for the rest of the summer and also into the fall as well. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Afridi, and thank you to everyone tuning in tonight. Um, and I wish you a, a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leah. I appreciate it. Honored to be here. Good night.